All right, everybody, welcome to the 368th edition of the Holy Backboard Podcast. I am Dustin here in Rip City, and I got my man. Sage kicking it live here on uh, a kind of crappy Beaverton day, but, you know, it's been a minute since we talked about these Portland Trailblazers, and uh, I'm excited about doing it. Yeah, and uh, given the the state of the team, I think a, a week break in between episodes was necessary because even a two week hiatus, one one could say, putting together my show notes, I was like, we said that, we said that, we said that. So it's starting to get a little bit of a, a Groundhog Day type of theme when you're talking about the Portland Trailblazers, which ironically is how I felt this past week because it was freezing rain, freezing rain, freezing rain. Okay. You're not going outside. You're staying at home. Daycare's close. And you're just like doing the same stuff on mm-hmm. loop for like seven days straight. So groundhog day has definitely been a a theme in, in my life recently. So it's really no surprise. The trailblazers are following suit. So let's go ahead and uh, recap what's happened since we've last recorded uh, the blazers. Solid at home, god awful away from the friendly confines of the the Rose Garden. If we go back to that road trip on January 9th, the Blazers got blasted by the Knicks 112 to 84, lose by 62 on the 11th to the Oklahoma City Thunder 139 to 77. And on Friday, to close out the road trip, they just get beat down again by the Minnesota Timberwolves 116 to 93. Then with like eight guys, they play a very competitive game against the the full strength Phoenix Suns, uh, losing one twenty seven to one sixteen. Scoot Henderson had thirty three points, nine assists in that performance. Uh, Wednesday they bounced back. They beat the Brooklyn Nets for the second time this month on an Anthony Simons game winning uh, floater. Uh, once again against Mikael Bridges, folks would remember he did that against the Phoenix Suns opening night the, pre- the previous season. Uh, so they defeated the Nets uh, one hundred five to one hundred three. Beat the new look Indiana Pacers, who returned Tyrese Halliburton, and it was Pascal Siakam's debut. Did so 118 to 115, but then the road woes really struck again. Uh, non competitive game in Los Angeles against the Lakers, uh, 134 to 110. This was a Lakers team that's been struggling mightily since winning the in season tournament and recently just lost to those Brooklyn Nets, who Portland has swept this year. So uh, basically, a roller coaster. For the Portland Trailblazers, they are 12 and 30 on this the season, which has finally reached the, the the halfway point. They are second to last in the Western Conference and fifth overall. If you want to look at the draft positioning, with real no real chance of of moving ahead of the four, really. You're looking at teams like Memphis and Toronto and Chicago and Atlanta uh, jostling them for that fifth spot in the draft lottery, but 12 and 30 as things shake out. And um, how do you want to want to start this? Age? There's been a lot since we we've covered, but um, what what's what stood out to you? Um, when we go against a defense that is respectable, like it, it, if if the defense we're going against can stop isolation threes and drives to the hoop, we're losing by 40 plus. Like you look at OKC, one of the best defenses, Minnesota, the best defense, New York Knicks are really slow. So every possession means so much more than, you know, against the Pacers, the Pacers defense is atrocious. They're the fastest team and the worst defense. So we did well, like the hoop was open for Jeremy Grant and the rest of the team to go after him. So when we when we go against that elite defense or just a respectable one, like I don't think the Lakers are that great of a defensive team. A.D. covers up so many of the mistakes of everybody else. Like D'Angelo Russell is one of the worst point guard defenders in the in the league. But they have A.D. there to cover up all mistakes. And A.D. is probably always going to be in there for one of the best defensive D- DPOI players. So that that elite defense just, we can't keep up. And our offense isn't good enough to, like, unless they're just on an all-time cold streak, our offense isn't good enough if the defense is elite. And then our defense just looks so much worse. Like, it's, it's a free run to the hoop whenever, if, if anybody wants it. So... I mean, I'm glad that we got our dubs, but, you know, the Nets really aren't a 
two feet in the paint type of shooting team. They're mid range jump shooters, and you know, Mikhail can kind of get in. And Cam Thomas got hurt, so he's the one like the only one that attacks the rim. So, you know, the the recipe for success for the Blazers is going against a bad defensive team with no rim, <laughs> you know, no center that blocks shots, and uh, hope to God the opposing team doesn't do well. So, it, it's it's been a very uh up and down week but it's kind of explainable that we beat the nets without any interior pressure coming towards us and the pacers just can't stop anybody defensively yeah the it's it's one thing to lose and i was pretty concerned about this team on that that road trip like the stats are pretty jarring i've been a fan since 1990 i've been through the sergey monia juan dixon victor criapo blazers like I don't recall them ever being this bad for a stretch of basketball with legitimate NBA players on your yeah. roster. They, they went one and six age. Here were the, the point differentials. Phoenix minus 21, Dallas minus 29, Dallas minus 36, Brooklyn plus seven, Oklahoma city minus 62, Minnesota minus 23. We were outscored in a seven game span by 164 points. That's an average margin of defeat by 28 and a half points. Your offense only eclipsed 100 points one time, and the average score was the opponent 124, Portland 97. And if you even add in that Laker game, it falls mm-hmm. in that same trajectory. You're losing by 24 points. You you did eclipse 100, but you gave up 134 points. Uh, you're just getting beat down by 24 to 28 points again. Like these non-contests. Again, with legitimate NBA talent, you've got DeAndre Ayton, you've got Jeremy Grant, Anthony Simons, Malcolm Brogdon, Matisse Thibel. I mean, yeah, it's not a playoff roster, but this is this is a better roster than what we've seen during those lean years after that 12 deep Blazers and the rise with us. Like there was the three Who was four, the coaches yeah. of those teams? Nate McMillan. Nate McMillan's a pro. Yeah, Nate McMillan <laughs> gets the best out of players. I remember in the 2010 season, you got Greg Oden blows out his knee. Brandon Roy, uh, up and down, all knee surgery. Joe Prisbilla blows out his knee and then slips again in the shower at home and does more damage to it. Uh, they have to trade for Marcus Camby. I mean, they're they're getting the the OG Chris Johnson um, to come play. Nate McMillan blows out his Achilles because they've lost so many bodies in practice playing defense. And he got that team to 52 wins in a six seed. Um, and they took the Suns, who went to the Western Conference Finals, to six games. So there's... For a team that preaches togetherness and connectivity, I see, I mean, the, the more the season goes on, I, I continue to see less and less of that. It's, um, it's the most dis- disjointed team there's, ever. There's no roles. There's no, ro- there, there's no responsibility. There's, there's just no, the players don't know what to expect on a game-to-game mm-hmm. basis. I, I've talked about in the last episode how Jabari Walker had a really great performance against the Spurs uh, to end uh, 2023, and then he basically was MIA for a stretch of three or four games. Well, the same thing is happening with, with Scoot Henderson, who plays 40 minutes against the Suns, 33 points, nine assists, one of the, the better performances that, that we've seen from him, yet he comes back with 23 minutes against Brooklyn, eight minutes against Pacers. I know he did leave that game early. So eight first half minutes against the Pacers. And then he plays just 23 minutes against the Lakers. And it so he was projected falls. for 16 against the Pacers. Yeah. And it, so it all falls in line with Malcolm Brogdon returning. Okay. There is a problem when you're trying to judge a top three overall pick and you're saying, why is he so up and down? Well, Sage, wouldn't you be up and down if you were starting getting 40 minutes, getting the green light, you're running the show. And then I just watched that Brooklyn Nets tape again last night before bed. Scoot Henderson, if he's on the floor, he's playing off ball. Mm -hmm. I I love Scoot. He's worthless off ball right now. Mm -hmm. He's not a threat to shoot from the outside. There there is no off ball productivity in this offense, regardless of who's off ball. Like you've seen that really decline, especially with the playmakers of Josh Hart and Trenton Watford exit out the door there's no more backdoor lobs to sharp like there, there's no off ball movement the only thing the blazers are doing they're running a high pick and roll or they're doing some dribble penetration 
and kicking it out for a three. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a swing, swing three. But that is the limits of the Blazer offense. So you you want to look at Scoot and say, man, why is he struggling? I mean, some of the things are on him. He's making some uh, amateur passes that need to be tightened up. He needs to finish around the rim. Um, I've never uh, seen a guy with such athleticism struggle to just he, – he's blowing some easy layups. But mm. I'm not too concerned about the, that because – when I'm watching him, I'm watching the process, not the result. Like, how does the shot look? Is he making the right decision? It's not his fault if, if a big man, you know, whiffs on a layup. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to look as an assist in the, the box score. But what's the process? If the hard part's getting to the rim, the easy part, he'll he'll figure that out how, how to make that 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 layup down the road. I'm not worried about that. But when you put him on the floor, and you're saying, okay, now just go off ball, or you're coming off the bench. Or now you're going to start. And, and they're doing this to every single player. Shane yeah. Sharp's been, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out of the lineup. Um, same thing with Jabari Walker. Um, you're starting. It, it's, just, it's really hard for these players to really have an identity themselves when they don't know what they're going to get. The only constant for the Blazers is Jeremy Grant and Anthony Simons. They are the, the one and two. Mm -hmm. And that can differ on either night. Like exactly. They, they, they are change. guaranteed they are guaranteed to get their shots and they, they know their pecking order. Nobody else knows what's going on. Uh, I've talked about the marketing department is promoting Shaden and DeAndre for, for all-star along with Jeremy Grant. They don't pass the ball to DeAndre. He gets hardly any, any he gets zero there. touches basically. Shaden, unless he uh, like, Shaden's a ghost out there unless, unless Ant's not playing and he knows, okay, it's my, it's my turn. Like there, there's, there's just no, like we saw this last year with Anthony and Dame. Ant didn't know. He's like, I, I got to defer. I got to defer. That, that's he called him. That's big bro. I have to defer. At some point, the coach has to step in and say, stop. You're also a starting caliber player. We want you to take shots too. So once your coach enables you to do something, then you will feel empowered to do that. Uh, there's no other, I think, great example than this than right now, which we're watching with the Detroit Lions of the NFL. Mm -hmm. They're making their first comp. They won their first playoff game since 91, the 91 season. I was six years, six years old. I'm, I'm 38 now. Like that, that is a long time to go. Mm -hmm. But what I wouldn't have been born yet. What their ownership did was they identified a coach. The coach identified a culture. They worked hand in hand with the GM. They, I remember watching those last three drafts and the, the analysts got on them taking players too high uh, Sam Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, those were their guys, th mm -hmm. their system. They have an identity. They have a certain type of player that they want to find, and it works with their team, their town, their city, and, and they've got something going. Portland has none of that. It is so disjointed with what this franchise is trying to do. You look from the business side to the basketball side to the management side. This was supposed to be "quote unquote" Chauncey's guys, and yet we're seeing worse results than than we really have ever seen mm. before. No, don't tell me about the injuries. Every team is going through through injuries. You're you're still you're still getting Jeremy and Anthony most nights. I mean, those are still NBA dudes. Matisse is an NBA dude. Malcolm is playing a lot of minutes. Like you've got players, and the the results just have been absolutely unacceptable. I can't even really blame the players, man. It's it's the coach putting them in positions where they're bound to fail eventually. Like, you know, Jeremy Grant played really well when there was zero other players besides him and Shaden. But now it, it, he's he's playing the exact same way with pros next to him. I, I think that Chauncey enables those two and nobody else. But I think that he puts them in really shitty – like, you, you saw Tumani come off the bench, and he's much better in that role where he's not the, the do-all, end-all, be-all defender, rebounder. And I, 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 I now we have three non-shooters if we're playing, which really sucks. But it, it's it, – I can't really blame players. The coaches are putting them in positions where they just absolutely cannot succeed, you know, efficiently sustainably it just isn't a uh a worthwhile bet like the, the until chauncey billups gets fired and we get like the dan campbell coach we're just running in place until that that happens whether it's you don't want to pay chauncey the extra money to leave or you actually believe in him 
nothing really sustainable or efficient or you know secure is going to happen until the guy that has the worst offensive and defensive scheme for his players leaves like drop weave can't play a really aggressive style of defense so when he does we give up 80 fucking points in the paint it's not that hard to recognize oh we probably should be drop coveraging drop let him you know use his big body box out get rebounds not all right we're gonna trap deer and fox make him make a decision that's not gonna happen Dwap reef can't do it and he he tries hard it's just he his body type doesn't do well with the 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 defense offensively we're really not running anything like you know stupendous one of our listeners is a high school coach i i'm willing to put money that he has a better offensive scheme than what we're seeing right now with the AAU style of basketball that we're watching with the Portland Trailblazers. So, like, until it changes schematically, we're not going to see a Detroit Lions type of revival. We're like the New Orleans Saints doing the same shit over and over and over and over and over again. So, like, I don't blame Jeremy Grant. This is what he's being told. Now, if we were playing with a coach that had a scheme, I would tell Jeremy Grant, you have 0.5 seconds to make a decision. If you can't make that decision in 0.5 seconds, you need to pass the ball. But we don't have that 0.5 mentality. We have, you know, long, long, like, the load times to think about what we're doing. Jeremy Grant, when he goes north-south, is a really effective scoring machine. But when the second he goes east-west, it's going to be a bad attempt for us. So I, I really think it's just schematics and coaching and play, putting players in positions to fail is the reason why we're losing by 60 to it, you know, to the, to the Thunder. Great team and all, great defense, but we shouldn't be losing by like a million points. Like Josh Giddy got a triple-double in 20 minutes. That's fucking insane. Yeah, we've been monitoring these these numbers all season long, but they continue to not change in a negative way. Uh, Portland is last in the league in points per game, 107.5, uh, second to last in offensive rating at 108.1. They give up the 19th most points in the league at 117. So their net rating is nearly minus 10. That's third worst in the entire NBA. Do you know how bad you have to be offensively to have the worst offense in the year 2024? Like the worst. Like you're worse than... The Wizards, you're worse than the Spurs. You're worse Memphis than, without fucking Ja Morant. You're worse with Memphis without Stephen Adams, Ja Morant, Marcus Smart for half the year. Uh, I mean, just it's it's, it's Brandon Clark. You're worse, than, you're worse yeah. than the Washington Wizards. Like that, you have certified NBA bucket getters on your squad, and you you can't draw up the the just the basic schemes. And no. what's the most maddening well, that... stage is I've seen them for stretches small stretches but i've seen them run sets that get players e easy open looks and then mm -hmm. they just completely go Forget away about from them yeah and it's it's not anything uh elaborate it's like oh let's get Shaden going downhill and so he can stop and elevate because he can jump out of the fucking gym and shoot a 15 foot mid-range shot they just completely go away from just just the simple things and it's like nope let's just iso um, and if you can get past your guy, you know, dribble and kick it out for for a Matisse or a Tumani three, because that's that's where we want our guys at. Yeah, I it, yeah, it's it's just we don't have an offensive scheme that matches with the players. We don't have a defensive scheme that's versatile that switches to you know what our players are good at. Like Tumani isn't a on ball defender. Matisse isn't at this age in his career. They're both really good off-ball guys, team defenders. But let's put them in that Robert Covington role where he's not even ready for being the on-ball guy. Like, that, it, it's just we're not putting them in a good position to succeed. And then the players are the ones that are getting blamed. But, you know, I know Chauncey Phillips isn't Larry Brown that can create a scheme around the players that he has. But let's have at least, like, you know... We got outcoached by Darvin Ham. And Darvin Ham steal just stole what works. He just stole what works in 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 the NBA and uses it. And you know what? That's pretty great. 
we don't even have what works in the NBA. We have the worst and least, you know, complex scheme. You know who drew up our scheme? Scotty Brooks and Chauncey Phillips, who are unimaginative. Like, you know, you, UConn Brooks would run was, circles around us with schematics. Scotty, Scotty Brooks' scheme was get the ball to KD. Russ, go downhill. Bradley Beal, please save us. John Wall, please save us. Like it, 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 we have just a bad staff. I don't, I don't even know if Roy Rogers is good. Like, he just has this really aggressive scheme, and when we're healthy and bought in, we might be able to do it a few games in a row. And then we, it gets hard. We stop doing it, and it, it, it's, it's, it's just bad messaging from the head of basketball operations down where like what we're doing, it's just not working and we're not adjusting to it ever. Like if we're losing by 20, call a timeout, try and get momentum change, like do something. And we're just not doing anything and we're getting embarrassed. One change notable since we've last reported was Jabari Walker replacing Tumani Kamara in the starting lineup, which essentially puts Bari at the four and Jeremy at the three, which given Jeremy's lack of rebounding prowess and Jabari's willingness to scrap in the paint, I think that has positively impacted Grant. He had two solid games at home, uh, 30 points, eight rebounds, on 54% shooting from the field, uh, the game tying put back against the, the Brooklyn Nets, uh, just, a, just a scalding hot 37 points on 50% shooting uh, against the Pacers with four boards, three assists, two blocks. Like that is what you want to see from Jeremy. And I think that if, if he's going to be a long term Blazer, all reports indicate they're not looking to move him at the deadline. You still have four additional years on his contract. He needs to probably be a small forward. He, mm -hmm. he just he doesn't rebound. Uh, he doesn't like to play in the paint. Likes to shoot the three. Likes to be on the perimeter. Likes to operate in the mid range. Uh, he might drive here and there, but that that's really where he's at. And uh, I think he's got good good small forward size, and I think he's an undersized power yeah, forward. Yeah. And you know maybe two or even as little as two or three years ago, small ball was like effective. We are seeing more length in size slowly but surely uh trickle into the nba where I, I think small ball is going to be a thing of the past like everything in the nba is cyclical i think it's starting to go back and i'm not saying that the big man of the, the 80s and 90s are making a return but they're going to make a return and they're going to be mobile they're, mm -hmm. they're mo mobile so you, you need to have a lot of size you need to be a plus position in terms of size I mean, God, Portland hasn't been that in probably since the Rise With Us era. Uh, we, we've just been so small at so many positions. So I did like that change, moving him over to the, the three uh, and allows you to do a little bit different things. And I think it's also a good reward for Jabari Walker. I, I don't think he's ever going to be a starter on a contending team, but the, the kid works his ass off. He can spread the floor and he's he's willing just to scrap and, and play with some some grit and Watching a lot of the Blazer games, you, you don't see a lot of that. Um, you just see a team that kind of just gets d defeated and gets into chucker mode and just feels like it's let's just get out of here and get on to the next city. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really nice that, that Jabari is kind of getting that that reward and hopefully it keeps up. And like you also mentioned, I think it's better for Kamara. I think starting was in over his head. Um, he can go to just being an aggressive player off the bench. You don't have to really rely on him to do much in that starting unit. And, you know, Portland has got off to so many bad starts previously. Jabari's energy and ability to at least create some offense uh, sh helped alleviate that a little bit, especially in those those home games. Not and his so willingness to use his body against the opposing yeah. Yeah. You, player. Yeah, you have to be able to throw your body around. I mean, I think he's, again, we just don't have the the personnel to run. Oh, that sucks. We don't have the personnel to run like a competent five so the fact that he's willing to be aggressive with the use of his body is very helpful i mean like i i think it's a nice reward i don't i don't i don't see him being a starter but he's in the role he's doing a, a good job with the effort um i i really think that he has an issue with knowing who's on the floor with him he can't play the same way every time he's on the floor 
because you know you have to think about you know who you're on the floor with but again i don't care it's 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 about it's about just having someone that forces the defense to react a little bit like jumani doesn't did not in that role did not force them the opposing defense to react to him at all jabari because of his physicality and his willingness to bang you at least have to let's send some defensive pressure towards him a little bit so i mean everything helps and you know like when we're going against teams that don't have a shot blocker jeremy grant's great What have been your thoughts? I know he just returned after a month absence. What have been your thoughts on DeAndre Ayton's season at the midway point? Uh, we're looking at 13 points, 10 and a half rebounds, 54% shooting from the field, um, numbers down across the board. Um, do you think it's a product of him being in and out of the lineup a product of a coach not knowing how to utilize him. Bang, bang, a bang. Of, a product of DA just being kind of Yusuf Nurkic in, in the sense that you're going to get great nights and you're going to get some god-awful nights. Like, is this just who he is as a player? Like, or do you think there is still something left in the tank? Not number one overall pick tank, but borderline all-star tank, top 10 center tank? Because right now... Um, I, I would classify his season as disappointing. It's not all on him, but I expected a little bit more. Like he was leading the league in rebounding for the first like two or three weeks of the season. I was like, okay, even if you're not shooting, I mean, you are just cleaning up the glass and, you know, 30 minutes, eight rebounds against the Pacers, obviously, you know, half the game because it was a blowout, but only four boards uh, in 22 minutes against the Lakers. Like it just, I sh shared with you that clip of him just kind of moving around uh, a screen uh, it's trying to set a screen like we know he hasn't been the strongest setting screens this year uh so yeah i just wanted to get your thoughts on da at the midway point because it was portland's you know major acquisition uh in the offseason i legitimately can't i can't blame him he's just getting like when you trade for a center with the blue chip value that he got drafted with you should empower him and make sure he's involved, but he never touches the ball. So why would he want to bust his ass defensively if he's never going to get rewarded with, you know, either more responsibility or more minutes really where he fucks up and while briefs in. So I get why he's not as effective as possible. And like when he was leading the league in rebounds, like he was trying to get the ball by any means necessary. Now he's not like, I, th I think it's a Chauncey Bills problem. Do I think he's an all-star? No. But is he a top 14 guy? Absolutely. But, like, even with Chris Paul, we didn't see him be a superstar. We saw him be a very good player. But, like, he's not – he's not – he's not as good as what he's getting paid as. So, that sucks, but – this year is not – I can't blame it all on DeAndre. I think most of it's Chauncey Billups' fault. Yeah, you look at the the numbers. The rebounding is in line with career averages. So are the blocks. Uh, so are the assists. Um, the steals are up. Where you're really seeing the, the decline is uh, free throw attempts. Just basically won a game. He was getting three last year. I know that's not a huge gap uh, to make up, but that's still – you know, potentially two extra points per game, but you're looking at the shot attempts last year in Phoenix, uh, 30 and a half minutes per game, getting up 13 shots a night this year in Portland, playing a minute more per game, only 11 shots and the field goal percentage, 59% last year, all the way down to a career low, 53.7%. So what I'm seeing is you had Chris Paul, who was getting him a lot of rim runs, getting him a lot of lobs, a lot of easy looks. This year, he is much more adapt to operating in that that free throw line extended where he can do that, but I wouldn't want the majority of his shots going there. And I think the biggest miss so far from the staff, and I would say injuries did play a role in this because Scoot got hurt, and then when he came back, DeAndre got hurt. And it's a career Malcolm, low in usage for him. Yeah, Malcolm so. is a scoring point guard. Anthony Simons is a scoring guard. Scoot Henderson while he's 19, is a pass-first point guard. 
And the thing I was excited most about with him was his connection with DeAndre Ayton. I want to see over the next 40 games, those two play as many minutes together as possible. They need to develop a rapport. Scoot does a great job. You watch the tape. Don't look at the box score. Rewatch the tape. He will get guys looks. He can get to the paint. He's struggling to finish himself, but he is getting others looks. And we've seen flashes of it. He had that opening lob in Detroit uh, to DeAndre to start the game. Like we, we've seen he and DeAndre start to get it. And then obviously the injuries uh, took their toll. I want to see that be a focus, right? Well, so hopefully, hopefully those two have only played 224 minutes I know. together. I that's, know. And that's what I want. That's what I want to see these next 40 games. Jeremy, we know what you can do. Anthony, we know what you can do. Matisse, we know what you can do, right? They need to really put an onus on seeing if that guard big man relationship is worth mm-hmm. developing, worth pouring energy and assets into and resources into to see if it's something that can be uh, worthwhile because it will not only benefit DeAndre, it will benefit Scoot. Because if you have a role partner who is a threat to catch a lob, that avenue is going to be much more easier for Scoot to navigate rather than if they think DeAndre is not going to go there or he's not able to complete that pass or he just wants to shoot jumpers or they don't even get a chance to work on it. Like when Scoot's going in there, who, who's he going to throw the ball to? Like Jabari's not an above the rim finisher. Neither Reith is a pick and pop finisher. Like Jeremy's a, another pick and pop finisher. Like you need somebody to go and get the ball and score points in the paint. The Blazers get just demolished every night in the paint. And you're, mm. you're not going to win consistently. In fact, you're going to lose significantly every single night, like we've seen on the road, when you consistently struggle to defend the paint and struggle to score in the paint. So that's 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 the biggest thing I want to see. I want to see Scoot and DeAndre. Both are healthy right now. There, there's no excuse. Like, get, get it done. It's not going to happen, but the, the, it, we're too busy trying to get Malcolm Brogdon 40 points a game. I'm looking at like the the you know Scoot Henderson absolutely struggles with when he's on the court offensively with DeAndre Ayton, but DeAndre Ayton is an absolute menace. This is a, like Scoot Henderson is his best pairing because of the passing, and he's actually efficient and gets the ball. Like I bet you, like. The only way that his statistics are high right now is because of Scoot Henderson, because Malcolm Brogdon and Ant aren't aren't setting him up. So, again, I I don't blame Da. I blame everything. Like you know, I blame the the coaching staff. I blame him them incentivizing driving over trying to establish any paint scoring. So, I don't think he's on the level of. Uh, joker or Embiid or you know demonis savonis because he's not but he isn't this bad and now next year it's kind of like okay is he good enough to garner this or are we going to go on the scrap heap and try and get a daniel gafford or a you know one of those replaceable centers but they fill a role and play defense and, and, and score so and until Billups is gone, I, I can't I can't have like a s- cemented feeling about our tertiary or secondary players like DA. It just it, it, it it's not fair to him. It's it, you're being put in the worst situation possible. And you know, he, he is getting a double double and he actually, you know, puts some resistance on, on defensively, even though at times he's really unmotivated by the lack of rewards for, you know, decent play. So I, I, I truly can't blame DA right now. He's the, he's been put in a position where no one passes except Scoot and, and Shaden. All right. We got a really interesting fan question uh, between the first, between our last episode and this one that we recorded. And I wanted to get your thoughts. It's from at GN Stoymanov on Twitter says what are your top seven dream trade targets trade deadline is too realistic or like realistic okay because yeah i would love for us i think some of some of uh the ones listed are are a bit far-fetched but good 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 targets i will list there 
uh, top seven. Uh, Jalen Duran, if Detroit resets again. Jonathan Kaminga from the Warriors. Jarris Walker from the Pacers. Amen Thompson, in parentheses, by low from the Rockets. I think that's out the door. That's out 15, the door now. Yeah. 15.4 rebound, uh, five assist performance in his first start. Uh, Cam Whitmore from the Rockets. Ujman Jang from the Thunder. And Olivier Maxence Prosper from the Dallas Mavericks. Sage, I put together my list. Do you have your list? Uh, No. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead, and you can kind of riff off of what I have, because I think there are some similar names, maybe some different ones. I actually found nine players um, for mine. Uh, The Pacers, I think, are a really good trade target. They've got two players that I'm interested in in adding to the team. Uh, Clearly, Jairus Walker is one. Uh, He's the number one guy I would do. He has been on our board on our radar for a long time. You're looking at just a great rebounder, a great playmaker, a elite Perfect defender. Perfect scoop. Yeah, who's just not getting off the bench in Indiana, and they're clearly in win-now mode. Um, and who knows if there's a role for him with, with Pascal Siakam uh, on the roster and Miles Turner as well. Um, I also like TJ McConnell from the Pacers. I think the Blazers about, need, Yeah, I like that. I think the Blazers need a backup point guard who is not a threat to take any minutes away from Scoot, but who's also a competent backup point mm-hmm. guard who's not just going to let the show go off the rails once he's in the game. He's also kind of a bit of a hard ass, and I, I just think the Blazers need someone like that. Like, we, yeah, yeah, I like it. Where, where's our Joel Prisbilla? Where's our you know Brian Grant, Buck Williams, Maurice Lucas? Like, you just need somebody who's going to get in there and just like kind of piss off somebody. And we, we you, just don't. Did have... you did you see the first Pacers game? He pissed the shit yeah, out yeah. of. Uh, Scoot and Shaden, and he's he's out of their rotation too. He, yeah, he's getting, well because he, Demhart's good. Yep. So yeah. you know he's he's a, he's a good player, and and I should say, like when I look at trade targets, I'm looking at realistic folks. Are you looking at Herbert Jones? Real, realistic folks, uh, teams looking to sell. Um, I look for non-stars. Obviously, you're not getting Giannis or Jokic. I look for young players not in the rotation, uh, players that you have that others want. So that's why, you know, some of these uh, won't check every box, but they check some of them uh, for the Pistons, uh, two players as well. And the Pistons are are a tough one because they're such a dumpster fire that you don't know which way ownership and management are going to go. Um, so you might be able to get one over them. Um, I, we, Sar Thompson, I think would take a, a lot to get, but just given how badly things have gone in Detroit, um, I, I, I know he's a non-shooter, but I am, in enamored with the athleticism the playmaking uh the defense the connectivity uh i I think you can live with i think you can trust that he's going to put in the work like i think he's he does everything so well that i'm willing to to let it let it marinate i mean small sample size he did shoot 38 percent from three in the playoffs uh, on eight attempts a game so he he has the ability that was a overtime elite just overtime elite yeah yes yeah, and then uh, another backup point guard who's not really getting much run, who had success previously, in, in Monty Morris. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's totally. a pretty cheap, cheap option, but he was killer for the Denver Nuggets before he was moved uh, to the Wizards. Again, he's a perennial backup. He's not looking to jump into a. He knows his role. He exactly knows his role. So that's another player that I would go after. Uh, one of the similar players we had um, as our question is Jonathan Kaminga. Um, I don't think it's realistic because I don't think Golden State views him as a trade asset. I, I think they hold him a little too high regard, kind of think of Neil Olshay and CJ McCollum. Uh, I, I think they're hanging on to that lottery pick because they drafted him, and so they have a higher view of him. But I would love to see what he can do if he's actually just given unleash. time to flourish and just unleash him. Uh, you know, you get that length and can play both forward positions. Uh, our guy Tari Eason on the Rockets, yep. like sooner or later – there's going to be one to two Houston Rocket players that are going to grow upset. There's just there's a lot of young talent on that team with uh, Cam Whitmore, Tari Eason, Jabari Smith, obviously Amen Thompson, Jay Sean uh, Tate, Jay Sean Tate. Like they, I would, you know, they, I would take Jay. I would put Jay Sean on my yeah. list too. Um, Tari's the guy I like. I, I, oh, another yeah. another kind of just dog who's going to be relentless, can play defense, not not afraid to scrap, not afraid to, to just to get 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 dirty out there. Um, I, I love what he can bring. A little bit of a, a menu in the. It's a bit of an experience, but I'm ready for that again. I, I, you know? I, I, I feel way more confident that Tari's going to be more successful than Aminu when he 
is uh trying to get active but i think jay i think any of the the houston rockets wings you know jay sean cam or tari if they if one of them is available i would take a swing i think jay sean yep. can play 37 minutes and give you really nice production from one of the wing spots like and tari eason is on like a minutes rest- hard minutes restriction of 22 minutes per game which really you know, gave Cam Whitmore a chance to be good and show what he can do. Now, there's obviously the behind the scenes stuff on Cam that made him fall so far, but you know, he was, you know, summer league MVP. Oh, he was also was a blue chip talent until the the you know behind the scenes injury plus attitude stuff came out. So he yeah. he is a good player. I I would worry about his lack of finishing around the rim, but it is what it is. Last three on my list, another backup point guard who plays defense, Miles McBride from the New York oh, Knicks. So if you're trading you Malcolm Brogdon to the Knicks, bring him back in. You need a point of attack. And he's on a good contract too. Yes. Another player who knows his role Um, came from West Virginia. So I, I really like what he can offer. And he played really well in that Blazers game uh, in Madison Square Garden. Um yep. Player who may not be available, but this falls into the players that we have that others may want. Keegan Murray from the Sacramento Kings. If they really want to go all in and get a Jeremy Grant type of player, we need to bring Keegan. No, no Harrison Barnes, Kevin Herter, Davion Mitchell package. None of that. If you want Jeremy Grant, that's fine. I'll I'll even throw in the Golden State Warriors pick. And Keegan Murray is a is a player who still has a little bit of room to grow, but Again, a player who knows his role and just plays smart basketball. Like he he's a really well-rounded player that I think would fit in really well uh, alongside of, of DeAndre. You give Scoot another play finisher mm-hmm. from three. Um, good contract. Obviously, you got his brother in and Chris. Uh, and then the last one, I don't know how available this player is, but I do think this team needs to decide between him and another wing. It is Herbert Jones. Yes, yeah. Um they have to decide. I mean, they've got they got Dyson Daniels. They've got Trey Murphy. They got Herb Jones. Like they, they got players. Najee as well. Even though I hate they, watching him play basketball, they are a talented young bunch. Going to have to start paying those guys, and you know sooner or later they're going to have to see if they want to take the leap as well. But you're looking at again long, athletic, lockdown defender. Like you start to see if he would here, be like, the he would be a very very great pairing with Scoot and Shade. Oh God, yeah. I mean, because you, you don't even have to. Herbert Jones is guarding Jason Tatum. Herbert Jones is guarding Luka Doncic. Like that, I, I, I mean, I love Herbert Jones, but Trey Murphy's better. Trey Murphy is going to be a superstar, so I'm willing to trade Najee and Herbert Jones so Trey Murphy can get as many minutes as humanly possible. If I was the Pelicans. Honestly, I think it's pretty obvious that they can't win with B.I. and Zion. So take a swing at B.I. if, like, if if, if uh, the GM of the Pelicans actually wants to make a move, see what it takes to get B.I. But I, I, would, I would throw in from the Kings, I want Trey Lyles. Yeah, not, be nice. not not in any like Jeremy Grant trade. I want Trey Lyles because I think that he fits versatility in the big position, can shoot, can play the four or five to finish games. I want I want something like that. Whether it be PJ Hall in the draft, trading for PJ Washington or Trey Lyles. I want a versatile four or five that can play defense, shoot threes, and rebound. So I, I want that. Um I do like a lot of your stuff. I don't think Ujman Jang, he needs so much development time, and we already that's, have a project. That's what I was thinking. Like, I'm high on him, but I think at a certain point, the Blazers need to take... It's him or I Ryan Rupert. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to you, trade you, stuff. You, 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 yeah, you have, en- you have enough repairs on this team. Yeah. I think at a certain point, you need to trade for either veterans who know their roles, who can play a backup role, or a young player who has at least hit a solid floor. Like a mm-hmm. Keegan, if he, that's where he stays. You're happy with it. Same with Tari, but there's room to grow. Like they've already are, have proven to be productive NBA talents. Like 
if you want to take a swing, do that in the draft, like through trades. I I, I wouldn't do that because I want to say floor. Ujman yeah. Jang has the most unsafe floor imaginable. Um, uh, anything. So the assets that I, that I would put on the table, uh, Matisse, Malcolm, Jeremy, I would put both our picks on the table. Uh, we we discussed in our first Future Friday, like we're not enamored with this draft, and I get the sense that a lot of teams aren't either. So I wouldn't just give away those picks. But if that's what it took to get, you know, I don't know how many teams put, are buying in this. Yeah, I, I don't think it. I don't think they're buying this draft. Like if but, we get you know, the first pick, we're not. We can't trade it. No one wants it. Like I don't want to sell the first overall pick for pennies on the dollar. Let's yeah. just take the guy. Even yeah, like. I, I see a lot of people in the draft space talk about, well, if you get the first to trade it back, who's buying it? No one's who's buying, buying it. it. Yep. Got to have a buyer and a seller. Um, let's quickly look at uh, this uh, road trip and then wrap this podcast up. Uh, I picked the uh, offline. I picked the Blazers beating the Nets. So we're now tied in the predictions. It's been kind of back and forth all year. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, the Blazers go at Oklahoma City at Houston, <clears throat> wrap it up Friday in San Antonio. Is this um, the first matchup against Houston? First matchup against Houston, okay. third against OKC and San Antonio. Obviously, Portland has been just clown stomped twice against the Thunder, and they have split games against the Spurs. Um, really rapid fire. I think they're going to get dominated by the Thunder. I think the Rockets are playing really good basketball, especially they're 16 and seven at home right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to beat Houston and they'll beat the Spurs. If when doesn't play, doesn't play. Yeah, 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 exactly. Plays, the Spurs are going to win. Like, like we've seen this, like this team is pretty easy to predict. So that's, that's where I'm going here. Um, and what I yeah, want to see. If when plays, I just, how are we stopping that? What what I want to see over these uh, three games, Scoot and DeAndre can, can just just let Scoot go. Like if you're going to trade Malcolm, hurry up and and do it because you need to develop this three overall pick. Like I want to see what DeAndre can do with Alperen Shangun. He is one of the best center off offensively. He he has like great passer. He, he has like the highest usage and assist rate on that team. Like he you you thought Fred Flan elite was going to be a big factor and he's just like a tertiary guy. He'll get assists, but really that offense is predicated on Alprin being an elite center. So if DA can show that he can get ready and play really hard against an elite guy, I think that's going to be good. Like the only times where we see Deandre being elite is against the Suns, which I guess you want to do the remember me thing, but I need that remember me performance against Houston and against all of these elite centers. Like if you can't get up for, I don't know, a top five center that, that there, there's some issues there. So I want to see how he plays in the beginning stages against Alperen. I get it. If you get discouraged because Chauncey Billups is absolute ass at decision-making, I get it. But I want to see you initially playing Alperen hard. All right. I got to pee. So I'm going to let you wrap this one up. All right, we're gonna, so uh, I, I say loss, loss, and potential loss. Um, but thank you all for listening. We will be back relatively soon to talk about Nikola Topic, a uh, Serbian-born point guard who uh, is very interesting uh, on our future Friday this week. And I personally will have a piece of content out on Clemson's PJ Hall. So. Be prepared for that. We're going to have a lot of content. Um, I'm kind of excited to do some solo stuff. It will be players that we don't really, there's zero chance that we talk about. So like the PJ Halls of the world, like he's a four-year senior. Holy shit. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know Dustin got us another cat. So he, uh, his kitty just popped up on screen and that was, uh, you know, surprising. So, Thank you all for listening. We will be back for a future Friday and then be prepared for the PJ Hall podcast slash YouTube coming out. So thank you all. We are available on iTunes, Stitcher, Himalaya podcast, everywhere where you get your podcast. We are, we are there. We're also available on IG um, for the reels and uh, TikTok for those 
a minute long clips of the show if you want to see us talking so thank you so much and we are out first